Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, would you turn please to the Gospel of Matthew? Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter number 6. Um, as we look at a, uh, really a topic tonight, um, the, the title of the, of the lesson is Dealing with Anxiety and Finding Peace. And the anxiety is something that we've all had to deal with. No one has, has been excluded from it, that's for certain. Uh, we've all had to worry about something. But why is that? Let, let's find out why we worry the way we do. Why do, why do so many believers have problems with anxiety? Um, you know, and, and maybe our, our scriptures tonight can certainly help us out, at least get us in the right direction. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning verse 25, For this reason I say to you, Yeshua speaking, Do not be worried. Do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow was thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry, then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, meaning the pagans, the unbelievers, eagerly seek after these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You notice in that, what I just read, five times, the Lord brings up worry. What? Why are you worrying? What, why, why are you worried? Do not worry. Do not worry. Five times. There's a, a, a huge difference between being worried and being concerned. When you're concerned, you're in control. When you're worried, worried's in control. When you're concerned, you can sleep at night. When you're worried, you can't. Uh, Yeshua in the Gospels, Paul in his epistles, um, they ever, never uh, encouraged anyone to just live a, a careless, carefree, or have some kind of irresponsible attitude towards life, towards people, towards problems. You won't find that anywhere in the Apostolic Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 12.25 So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. That's a concern. We, we ought to be concerned for the individual parts of Yeshua's body. Each other. We ought to be concerned. There should be care for one another. 2 Corinthians 11.28 verse 28, Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the congregations. So we should have concern about each other. We should be concerned. We should be concerned about our fellow believers. And, and believers we had never even met, but they're in churches. And there ought to be a concern for those, for those that, that are in our family. It's proper to be concerned about our future welfare. To the extent that we take responsibility to plan and save for the, our future needs. We should be concerned. We have a wonderful story in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 6. Look at the ants. The ants are concerned. So why shouldn't we be? Okay. Uh, Joseph knew that, the, that a famine was coming. He was concerned about it. And he took the proper steps. But proper concern turns to sinful anxiety when we lack faith in God's role as the sovereign Lord and provider. And when we put self at the center instead of 
God's kingdom and instead of his righteousness. And the focus is on us instead of on him. Then concern goes out the window and in starts coming worry. Many believers, many, dare I say the majority, will say on the surface, the words will come out of the mouth, that they are sustained completely by God. But in all honesty, they're afraid to put their full weight on him. Yes, I trust in God. Well, let's put that to the test. As they say, let's kick the tires on that. And so what what comes about it, it or comes uh, out of it, is what we know of as anxiety or worry. Few of us are, are strangers to anxiety. We've all... We've all had, at one point in our lives, sleepless nights. Something worried us. There was that anxiety. Uh, we often hear the phrase, I've said it numerous times in my life, man, I had a stressful day. You know, I'm really stressed out right now. Or you might hear about somebody saying I, they had a panic attack. Then we go to the scriptures, and guess what we find out? Biblically speaking, I had a stressful day. There is no such thing. There is no such thing as I had a stressful day. There's no such, there's no biblic, there's nothing biblically about I had a stressful week. Biblically speaking, there's no, there's no such thing as an addiction. There are, there is what is called, what are called strongholds. Strongholds. You can train your body to depend on something. And, and it's so easy to say, well, he's addicted. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, porn, what have you. No, that's a stronghold. And we know it's a stronghold because every weed has a root. There's no such thing as a weed without a root. And what is, what is the root of your so-called addiction? What is the root of the stronghold? What is the root of your stressful day? or stressful week? What is the root of that lady or that gentleman who had the panic attack? The root of it is sin. That's it. There is no such thing as a believer saying, I had a stressful day. No, you had a sinful day. And the, the, the quicker we can start to get off ourselves, if we can stop saying, I had a stressful day, I've had a stressful week, I'm stressed out, no, you're sinned out. <laughs> you had a sinful day. And maybe that will start to put things into perspective. Oftentimes, we feel anxious. We can feel anxious about our finances. How am I going to uh, make this month's bills? Everything is going up in price. Uh, will I, my, my, my car, my truck, it's getting older. Uh, am I going to have the money to fix it? What if I lose my job? What then? Uh... You know, I've got, I've got children. They're about ready to get out of high school. Um, or am I going to be able to afford college for them? Or are they going to be able to afford the college? Uh, can, uh, with the rising cost of, of uh, medical insurance and, me and, and, and medical bills, am I going to have enough money for the medical bills? I don't have a secondary insurance and, and on and on and on. Uh, what about retirement? I don't know. I mean, look at my Roth IRA. Look at my 401k. Uh, Social Security probably won't be there for me when I get to that age. I don't know. Am I going to have enough money? What if the economy tanks? What if the dollar goes belly up? And on and on. And we start to worry. We can feel anxious about our health. Especially as we grow older. What, what if I get cancer? What if I have you know, dementia or Alzheimer's? Uh, what, what if, what if uh, uh, my limbs fail me, my, my, my health fails me, and I'm disabled? What happens if my loved ones have to put me in a nursing home? Am I going to be a burden on them? Or if we're young and we have aging parents, well, what about my, my father? What about my mother? They're getting up there in age. And do, are they going to need a nursing home? Are they going to need, how are we going to manage this? And we worry about our health or the health of those we love. 
How about our children? We can get anxious about our children or our grandchildren. Will they turn out okay? I've done everything I can. Out in that world, are they going to avoid the drugs? Are they going to avoid the sexual immorality? How about social media and all the, all the pitfalls in there? Yeah, in this world, it seems like crime is, going, is, is, on the up, is on the rise. Are they going to be safe in a crime-ridden world? If they make it through, if they make it through college, are they going to get a decent job? Are they going to be able uh, to, to have the same kind of standard of life as what as, as I've lived in this generation? Will they will they uh, uh, get planted, find themselves in a good church or a congregation? Will they marry a godly person? Are they going to be happy in that marriage? If they have children, my my grandchildren, how are they going to be? What kind of world are they going to live in? And we worry. And it brings about anxiety. And if we don't deal with anxiety, and if we don't deal with the worry properly, then it snowballs. And all sorts of health problems happen. You start getting headaches, you can get migraines, you can get ulcers, you can get high blood pressure. And now you thought you had problems before. Now you got the health problems on top of it from, from the worry. Now you get to worry about, about your health problems, which you didn't have before. And yet Yeshua, on the night he was betrayed, the night he was betrayed, John fourteen twenty seven, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And that was hours before going to the cross. The most difficult night of his earthly life, as he faced the cross, and he said, peace I leave with you. If peace is what he left with me, how come I don't feel peace? Seven times in the Apostolic Scriptures, our God is called either the God or Lord of Peace. So to experience God's peace, and that's what we all want, I don't want the worry, I don't want the anxiety, I want God's peace. You and I have to learn how to pray with thanksgiving for every single concern. And the passage, the two verses I really want to focus in on tonight, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You and I, we have either read it or heard it read numerous times. Let's really take a very close look at this thing. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. So we got three key words in those two verses. Anxious, prayer, peace. Anxious, prayer, peace. Anxious, anxiety, worry. That's the problem. Anxiousness, worry, anxiety, that's the problem we're told to put off. Get rid of it. Be anxious for nothing. Prayer. So we know that anxiety is my problem. Prayer is the procedure we're told to practice. So we got anxieties, that's my problem. Prayer is the procedure which I'm, a, I'm supposed to practice. And if I, if I trust in the Lord and I do what He tells me to do, the result will be peace. Peace is the product we're promised by God. So anxiousness is the problem. Prayer is the procedure. Peace is the product. That's what we're aiming for. Because I don't know about you, I'm tired of sleepless nights. I want peace. So number one, we must put off anxiety. And we got to call it what it is. It's sin. I had a stressful week. No, you had a sinful week. I had a stressful day. No, you had a sinful day. And we got to get ourselves into that habit. Be anxious for nothing. In the Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua made it clear that anxiety stems from a lack of faith and from a wrong focus on the things of this world instead of the kingdom of God. Where's your focus? Is it an earthly perspective? 
Is it a heavenly perspective? If it's an earthly perspective, that's the wrong perspective. And it's going to result in anxiety and worry. If we excuse our anxieties by saying, hey, I'm only human. He's only human. She's only human. Anybody would feel stress in this situation. Anybody would feel anxiety or anxiousness in this situation. If that's the attitude we take, we're already behind the eight ball. And we're never going to overcome the anxiety and the worry because we're not confronting the root cause of it, namely, our sin. It all comes up. That's the root. You see the weed, there's a root. You feel the stress, your problem is sin. You just don't believe God. Our sin of not believing God and of not seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. Your focus is on the earth. Your focus should be on the heavenly perspective. Believers should have God's joy in every situation. And again, I say rejoice. And he said it from a prison. Goodness. <laughs> but here it is. Not so, all right, I, I, want, I want God's joy in my life. Not so I can just be a happy person. Because it's not about me. It's not about you. It never has been. It's all about Him. So it's not about my personal happiness. I want God's joy so I can be an effective witness for Him. In other words, we are seeking first God's kingdom. He said, if you seek God's kingdom first, all these other things will be added unto you. Heavenly perspective. Stop focusing on the earthly per Everything on this earth is going to be burned up. Why would you invest in this? So focus on his kingdom, not on my own happiness. If I focus in on his kingdom and his righteousness, the happiness will come with it. So we want to deal with our anxiety. Okay, I want to deal with it. I'm tired. I'm tired of being stressed out. Okay. Now, since you want to deal with your anxiety and you want to deal with your stress, what is your motivation for doing so? You say, I want to have peace. Okay. If our reason for wanting to be free from anxiety is so that we can just live a peaceful, pleasant life, where's your focus? It's on you. <laughs> I, want, I want to be free from anxiety. So I can just sit on the couch and be happy all day. That's self-centeredness. That's selfishness. And therefore it's wrong. There are many people, and this is the, the, the worm on the hook, who are going through stress, stressful uh, time, whether it's finances, health, family, all on and on and on. All you need to do, you need to come to Christ. You need to come to Jesus, and Jesus will give you peace. Well, that's a true statement, but what's the motivation? So you're walking the aisle, you're coming to Christ, for what reason? I just want peace. The focus is on you, then, instead of on, it, on Him. If they do not confront the fact that they are living to please themselves, rather than God, they will simply settle into a self-centered life where they, quote-unquote, use God for their own peace and comfort. So I'm coming to Jesus, not so I can do anything for Him, so that He can do things for me. Ah, wrong focus. Yeshua said, whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels shall save it. That's Mark 8.35. He's telling it's not about you. It's all about him. Back to Philippians 4.6. In relation to that, it means what we have here is not just a simple formula. Hey, if you're anxious, if you're going through anxiety, if you're stressed out, try prayer because it works. Rather, it means if you're anxious, examine yourself. If you're, if you're having a stressful day, if you had a stressful week, examine yourself. 
either your lack of faith in the living God who has promised to supply the basic needs of his children, you're lacking that. You don't really believe him when he says that. Look at the lilies, look at the birds, look at... Yeah, but that's the lilies and the birds, that's not me. Or you just simply need to examine your focus. Whether you're truly living for Messiah, you're living for his kingdom, you're, you want to establish his kingdom, or do you want to establish your own kingdom? And if you try to establish your own kingdom, that's an earthly perspective, and you're going to be drowning in stress. Whatever the root cause is, anxiety is sin. And it must be confessed to God, and as Paul says, put it off. Be anxious for nothing. I'm stressed out. Confess it to God because that's sin. That's the first step. Secondly, we must practice prayer with thankfulness about every concern. Philippians, back to Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. He mentions four Greek words here for prayer, and they overlap in meaning. And yet, each one is helpful if we distinguish what they are. we got prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, and request. First one, prayer. Prasuche. Prasuche. It's a general word for prayer, always used with reference, uh, reference to God, with the nuance of reverence. Reverence is the key word. This means that when we pray, we must stop to remember that we are coming into the very presence of the Holy God. He welcomes us into His presence as our Father welcomes His children. But understand, you are coming into the presence of God and there must be a reverence there. Hebrews 4.16 Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You're approaching the King. This means we must always examine our hearts. Examine your hearts, confess your sins, forsake the sins, when we come to God in prayer. If you do not do that, if I don't do that, if I don't confess my sins to God when I come to Him in prayer, my prayers are never going to get past the ceiling. Psalm 66.18 If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. There you go. Man, he's not answering my prayers. Maybe you're not confessing your sins enough. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please notice that the believer is told to come directly to God in prayer. We come to the Father through who? Our mediator, who is Yeshua. He is our high priest. We come to the Father. We say, in Jesus' name we pray. In Messiah, in Yeshua's name we pray. We're coming to the Father through Him. And yet it is the Holy Spirit who dwells in every believer, which prompts and moves us to pray. And even at times interceding for us. Romans eight twenty six and 27. In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So think about it. Prayer. Prayer is so personal, drawing near to a triune God. We're coming to God the Father through the, through the work and the position of, of his Son, who is our high priest, and the indwelling of the Holy, Holy Spirit, which prompts us to, to, to actually tell us what to pray for. So that's prayer. Prasuche. Supplications. The asis is that Greek word. And this word gives prominence to the sense of need, and also looks at specific requests. So we're praying, it's as if we can, we can, we're showing reverence, we're extolling His holiness and His wonder and all, you're so wonderful, that's prayer. Supplications, now, now we're all of a sudden, now here's this, this sense of need, and I'm bringing this to you. 
Sometimes people ask, why should I pray since God already knows what we need? And what you and I have to understand is the prayer is not so much for God. The prayer is for us. He is perfect. His will is perfect. It's like a car. A car, when things start to swerve one way, you need an alignment. Prayer is that alignment. Prayer gets us to align my heart, my mind, and, 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 my, and my soul, who I am, and get it in line with God. Because I want, I want my prayers to be effective. And if I'm praying outside of His will, they're never going to be effective. It shows us our total need for God Himself, not just for certain temporal benefits. It purifies our desires since we must bring them to God Himself. Our supplications present, uh, prepares us to receive thankfully what He gives, being reminded that it comes from His hand. Supplications help us to meditate on His kindness as we delight in what He has given. Supplications confirm to us our own weakness and God's great providence and faithfulness in meeting our needs. This means that our supplications must be in line with God's will and purpose. God's not answering my prayers. Maybe you need an alignment. <laughs> so we got prayer, we got uh, supplications, thanksgiving. The Greek word there, eucharistia. Eucharistia. What does that sound like, the English word? Eucharist. Eucharistia. Thanksgiving. Uh, I think we're all in agreement on this. Anxiety, stress, normally does not make me very thankful. <laughs> I've never been, man, I am so stressed right now, thank you, Lord. I can't remember doing that. And maybe that's my problem. Thanksgiving in a time of trials reflects three things. Number one, remembrance. The remembrance of God's supply in the past. Remembrance of God's supply in the past. You think back over His faithfulness to you. Up to this point, He's always been there. He's never failed you. And you realize that His mercies have sustained you. He has been with you in every single trial. He has never abandoned you, nor can He. He has never forsaken His children. Never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread. He has never failed me. Why would He fail me now? Remembrance. Secondly, submission. Submission. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Submission to God's sovereignty in the present. I know what you did yesterday. I'm submitting to your sovereignty in the moment right now. To thank God in the midst of a crisis or a trial is to say, Lord, I don't understand, but I submit to your sovereign purpose in this situation. I trust that you know what you're doing and will work it together for good. We're not just to thank God when we feel like it, but also when we don't feel like it. That's the challenge. I don't feel like thanking you, and yet I'm going to. You've been there with me every step of the way. You've never failed me. Why am I feeling like you're going to fail me now? So you got to remember, whatever it may be, you're stuck on the side of the road. You got a flat tire, or steam's coming out of the front of the front of the car. You may be stuck on the side of the road. Guess where your heavenly Father is? Still on the throne. We got to remember that. I may be here on the side of the road. I may be trying to get a hold of a tow truck. Lord, you're still on the throne, and I thank you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In every give, everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Messiah Yeshua. Thirdly, trust in God's sufficiency for the future. A thankful heart rests upon uh, the all-sufficient God, knowing that even though we don't see how He is going to do it, He will meet our every need as we cast ourselves on Him. <laughs> he tells Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32, Oh, by the way, Jerusalem and everything around you is going to be destroyed. But what I want you to do, I want you to buy that land from your uncle. Does that make any sense whatsoever? 
everything's going to be destroyed, and all these people and everything, so many of them are going to die, and a number of them will be carried off to Babylon, but I want you to buy that piece of land. Why? Because he's always true to his word, and guess what, Jeremiah? You're coming back. You're coming back. And that land you bought, it's going to mean something someday. I may not understand how he's going to do it. It doesn't matter. He's a God of promise. Jeremiah was trusting in God's sufficiency for the future. And in verse 17 of Jeremiah 32, he says, Ah, oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. There's a lady, I want to say it was Alabama, I, I saw a, a documentary on her or a story on her. A tornado came through her area and just totally, she got out of there and totally destroyed the home. I mean, just totally destroyed the home, except for one corner of the home. The corner of her house was still standing, and that was the corner where she, she, where she went each and every day and prayed. That was her prayer closet, if you want to use a term. And that was the part of the house that was still standing. And she stood there with nothing. Everything was destroyed, and she started praising God. And people are looking at her going, are you nuts? And she said, he's been so good to me for all these years. Why would I start to be mad at him now? And make a long story short, some things happened. Some people got together. And by golly, they bought her a brand new home. So the house that she moved into was nicer, newer, and bigger than the house that she had before. All because she stayed truthful to her Lord. Lastly, requests. Itama. This word overlaps with supplications, emphasizing the specific, definite nature of our petitions to the Lord. When Paul says to make our requests known to God, the Greek word means face to face with God. Request. It's like this. I may be trying to get a hold of you. I send you a text message. I just want to relay some information to you. I'll just send you a text message. But if it's a little bit more important than that, more important than that, I may give you a call. And then there are times when it's of utmost importance. I'm not going to text you, and I'm not going to call you. We need to meet. I need to come to your house. I need to meet you somewhere. We need to talk face to face. That's where Paul's going. Your requests. That is, God, I'm, I'm reverencing you. I'm thankful for you. I do have some needs. You and I need to meet face to face. Matthew 7, 7 through 11. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? So, confess the sins. Anxiety is sin. We need to pray. And thirdly, we are promised, we are promised, if we do that, we will experience God's incomparable peace. Philippians 4, 7, The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. Beware of positive phrase repetition. That has been made very, very popular by the prosperity gospel movement. And this is what the prosperity gospel movement did. And it came out of really out of the 80s and really got going in the 90s. This is what they did. They took like somebody would say, you know, this job is going to kill me. And somebody would say, well, you can't talk like that. Don't talk like that. Your words have power, and those are negative, and you're speaking a curse on yourself. They took that side of the coin, and they flipped it. Well, man, if your words can bring about a curse, then your words can also bring about a blessing. And so word faith theology emerged out of this. Your words can bring about a blessing. 
and Benny Hinn has made a ton of money off of that, and Joyce Myers, and Joel Osteen, and Kenneth Copeland, and Creflo Dollar, and a bunch of them have made a whole lot of money pushing word faith theology. Which is, and I've heard Osteen say it, if you want to be beautiful, ladies, you have to speak this into existence. If you want to be handsome, you have to speak this into existence. If you want the promotion, you must speak it into existence. And you'll see. God will make it happen. So in essence, you know what? That sounds pretty cool because I get to be God. And God, he gets to be my errand boy. Now, that really emanated out of truly uh, Eastern, Eastern religions, transcendental meditation. If you just say this over and 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 over, it'll come true. Paul is not saying that peace is not, it's, it's, Paul is saying that peace is not found in reciting words. Peace can only be found in a risen Savior and you're putting really your trust in him. We already have faith. We have saving faith. But how much do you trust Him? Can simply saying a prayer, repetition, here, I'm going to write out a prayer for you, and if you say it exactly this way, in fact, if you say it exactly this way, 25 straight times, you'll, you'll, you'll have peace in your heart. Paul is talking about an ongoing, deepening, intimate relationship with the God of peace, where you seek to please him with all your thoughts, words, and deeds. The peace that comes from the God, who is never subject to anxiety because he is the sovereign, omnipotent creator and Lord of the universe. Remember, whatever you bring to him, nothing takes him by surprise. So as we really conclude this lesson, do you know God's peace in the midst of situations that the world gets anxious about. Do you know God's peace in the midst of situations that the world gets anxious about? When everybody else is pulling their hair out of their head and running around like chickens with their head cut off, you're standing strong in the midst of the storm. If not, if not examine yourself, I need to examine myself. The faith I have, I have saving faith. But is my faith in him? And is my focus truly, really on his kingdom? Or is my faith really in what I can do? And I'm trying to establish my own kingdom. And if I establish my own kingdom, if that's what I'm trying to do, that's an earthly perspective, and I'll be subject to anxiety and stress, and worry. When was the last time you drew near to God in reverent, specific, thankful prayer? Thankful prayer in the midst of the storm. Father, we thank you for your word of truth. It is really, it is the law of liberty. It sets us free. It's all right here, Lord. Oh, but we are so oftentimes of little faith. And our focus, our focus gets off of truly who you are and what you have accomplished. Our focus gets off of really what your word has said and the promises that you've made in your word. And Lord, we get the focus off of all that and we get it on ourselves and on our problems and our worries and, and things like that, that are not pleasing to you. Lord, we confess our sins. We confess our sins. We know that you are God in heaven, that you'll never fail us. You're a good father. You always have been. You always will be. Lord, for those that are really struggling with stress and worry and anxiety, I pray, Lord, that we come to you in your son's name and we confess these things and we acknowledge them for what we are. It's sin. Lord, help us in this. Help us to focus more on the kingdom which is to come instead of establishing our own kingdom, really, which is built on nothing but sand. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers 
as well as answering our prayers. And we lift them all up to you in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.